Hi, it's Mike Edelhart, and I'm here with another edition of Inception, our podcast about beginnings, the beginnings of new companies, uh, new ideas in uh, science and uh, uh, health, and sometimes even uh, a little glimpse of the future. And today I'm here with really one of our most uh, unique companies and unique CEOs, Drew Vagrawal of Aether Biomedical. Uh, great to see you. Yep, same here. It's a pleasure. And so I'm in San Francisco and you are in? I'm in Poznan, Poland right now. So, uh, you know, anyone looking at you or listening to your accent may say, that's not a Polish looking face. That's not <laughs> a Polish accent. What's an Indian guy doing starting a company in Poland? And then uh, alongside that, tell everybody a little bit about what it is Aether does because it's it's really interesting. Absolutely. Uh, so just to just to give you a little background of myself, I pretty much come from a family of doctors. Both my parents are doctors, and because of that, I kind of joined medical school uh, or had to join medical school, as is the Indian tradition. Um, but I was never really interested in the clinical aspect of medicine, and I was more interested in the technological aspect surrounding medicine um, and the technological interventions in the clinical environment of today. Uh, and that's how basically the journey of Ether began when me and my co-founder uh, really wanted to look at human machine interfaces and how we control assistive devices and rehabilitate people in today's environment and how we can do it better. We initially started Ether back in India, but very soon we realized that if you want to build an international company, we have to go international from the very beginning. Um, and we luckily came across Poland, which is currently at a sweet spot um, in Europe where there is a lot of engineering talent available alongside public and private capital. And that's why we decided to move to Poland with the help of a Polish grant. And we just kept growing our team here in Poland. Uh, to tell you a little bit about what we do at Ether, so we are basically a medical robotics startup. Uh, we are about 25 people right now, um, and we are working on creating a control and communication layer between the human body and assistive devices, which would allow us to make rehabilitation data driven. So in short, when you go to a cardiologist today or you go to a pulmonologist today, they look at various types of biomedical signals like your ECG um, or they look at various type of imaging data before they make any sort of decisions or give you any prescriptions or suggest any procedure to you. Unfortunately, in the field of rehabilitation, when you look at how assistive devices interact with the human body, we are currently missing the paradigm of utilizing musculoskeletal biomechanics or biomechanical signals to really try to understand the human body better and rehabilitate people based on that. So that is exactly what we there do here at Ether is we build the tools, the softwares and the hardware required to acquire such biomechanical signals and use these to control various types of assistive devices. Got to begin, it. we're working on prosthetics. And the first product that we have is a multi-action bionic limb for upper limb amputees, which is much more affordable than any other product out there without compromising on the functionality. And it's built completely using additive manufacturing. Got it. Thank you. And yeah, it's really interesting. And, and when we first met, uh, uh, the company was initially focused around that hand. And, uh, uh, and uh, a number of things about it were uh, fascinating to us. One was we learned a lot through you about how this whole world works. And it was much more backward than I realized. These sort of strange things where you had to lock your hand into one of six positions or you had pulleys. And, um, and what you had built was much more natural and, and appropriate, uh, we felt, for uh, usability. And you had uh, gotten, we felt, quite cleverly to a point of having sufficient data about it to get clearance to do business in Europe, which most startups we see in these areas, they're far, far away early in their existence from actually having the approvals to go to market and do anything. And, and so I guess there's a number of questions in there. One is maybe talk a little bit more about this, how the hand works and how the operating system underneath it facilitates and then also, how did you get uh, uh, the, uh, the clearances needed to do business so young? Because you had gotten that before you even raised money. 
in the field of medtech in general um one of the things which i see a lot of uh, medtech uh, something which a lot of medtech entrepreneurs should really think about from the beginning is the regulatory aspect uh for me uh, my personal background it is in medicine i also have a bachelor's in management and then i did um a post grad certificate in medical regulatory from university of california so i was always very close to the regulatory environment and when we started building the zeus product line we made sure that we follow a modular approach of building products so we don't try to build execute on our final vision but we build the first version product which is still quite limited in its use case and that's why it was easier for us to approach the regulatory aspect and get clearance before we move on to more advanced things which would take more arduous clinical trials and things like that so i think you know dividing the project into stages where you could potentially follow a modular approach of uh getting products out there into the market can potentially help a lot with the regulatory aspect and of course uh this is something which needs to be on the back of the mind since the day one when a medtech product is even conceptualized um talking a little bit more about the hand so the zeus um is basically a multi action bionic limb where each and every finger is controlled by a individual motor so very similar to our human hand where a single tendon is used to control a single finger we have a single finger articulation where one motor controls one finger uh the zeus has its own uh, circuit board with its you know microprocessor and everything which takes input from the residual muscles of the amputees so even after amputation happens there is still residual muscle signals which exists in the body we build sensors which pick up these muscle signals which basically originate from the brain and would have uh, resulted in an action if a normal human hand would uh, have existed but in case of amputees we utilize these signals and decode the intent of the user on what the user wants to do and the machine um, learning algorithms within the zeus hand then translate these neural intent into actionable items uh, or actionable commands for the multiple motors that exist in the hand in the hand then uh, performs a particular gesture according to that this is a little bit about the version 1 we are definitely um, looking to expand on that and go to the point uh, with our version 2 product where we don't just control the prosthetic device but we provide sensory feedback as well to the amputee because closing the loop from act, uh, from intent to action to feedback is very important for us as human beings we as human beings can function in a three dimensional society while even closing our eyes i know um, i can take my hand and pick this glass up with my eyes closed but unfortunately amputees cannot do that because they do not have any sensations so this is what we are also trying to do in the future versions of the product is to not just detect but to provide feedback uh, as well Uh, uh it's a terrific vision uh and uh part of uh what we talk about at the fund is this shift from kind of a presumption of minimal enablement that you are in some way impaired to toward the notion of potentially hyper enablement that if you're building a hand then in theory you can build a perfect hand you could build an optimized hand you could build a hand that ideal for caressing a hand that's ideal for picking up heavy objects and in that way uh potentially make a person even better through this transition as opposed to just you know uh, you can pick up something big but if you try and pick up an egg you're going to drop it on the floor or you're going to crush it mm -hmm. no i i i completely agree with that and this is also a very important point where the fact is that prosthetics are not just any other medical devices but they are supposed to be an extension of a human being and they and humans or amputees need to feel connected to their devices and there needs to be a level of personalization associated with every device that is actually primarily the reason why we use additive manufacturing because we see a future where we can build a build a lot of customizable features within the prosthetic hand on a hardware and a software level and additionally we believe the same thing that or we believe in the thesis of hyper enablement as well there are so many sensors inside the prosthetic device and the muscle um, signal processing system why to why to use it why to use it just to control the prosthetic device with the version 2 we are actually looking at interfacing or integrating the prosthetic device with the digital environment around us and the iot ecosystem around us so you could potentially uh, switch the, the smart bulb in your home just by the flick of a wrist 
and with the sensors in the hand, you would have the capability to, to do so. Yeah, uh, got it. And let's talk about that a little bit. So when we first met, we were impressed with what you were doing, uh, the hand, the capabilities, the uh, uh, degree of development you gotten in the company early, but we recognized that that's a, a good market, but not necessarily the biggest market or the most dominant market. And obviously, it's limited by the number of folks who need hands and, and have that prosthetic requirement. But we felt and often feel that strong entrepreneurs will find their way. And they'll be looking at the market, getting feedback from the market and success comes from adaptation to all of that. And so you're talking in a completely different way these days than you did when we first met and you just did a second ago. So talk more about, uh, so you're not a prosthetic company now. Absolutely. I mean, this is a very exciting area for us and the way we have developed the company over the last a uh, couple of years and the way our team has grown as well, we see that they, we position ourselves as a, as a control and communication company, which is sitting in, the, in, in between the human body and the assistive devices. Now, these assistive devices do not have to be limited purely to prosthetic hands. It could be an upper limb exoskeleton. It could be passive orthotic devices or any other sort of assistive device, which is used in the field of rehabilitation today because unfortunately the communication between us as humans and the assistive devices today is completely broken it's not a bidirectional communication in any way or any manner and that is what we see ourselves as enabling where currently we are focused on utilizing the control and communication capabilities of our platform to power amputees to going to a stage where we can vertically integrate various pathologies on top of this platform and integrate with the millions and millions of third party hardware devices that currently exist in the market out there today and that's where I think we would see the biggest potential opportunity for us at Ether. Got it. So, uh, so where is the company right now uh, uh, in your development? And what do you see as uh, the next phase? What do you think is going to happen next? So we, we, we at Ether have a very grand vision, but at the same time, we understand that we need to execute really well on the first product that we are building. And that's why for the next two years, Ether is going to be primarily um, limited to upper limb prosthetics. Um, once we have deployed our solutions to its entirety in the domain of upper limb prosthetics, then we would move on to more upper limb related disorders in the upper limb weakening and upper limb paralysis stage. And beyond that, we would open up the capabilities of our platform to allow third party hardware devices to integrate with it and move on to the general world of rehabilitation post that. So you're an Indian guy with a Polish company that just did a, 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 a strong raise with an American lead uh, investor just to emphasize the now global nature of startups. So talk a little bit about the, uh, the raise and, and how all that worked out. And how'd you get an American lead uh, from uh, Poland? I mean, I, I think I have you to credit for <laughs> getting the, Partly, yeah. the American lead. So yeah, I mean, we, we are just closing, uh, we just closed a round of 3.5, uh, 3.6 million USD um, you know, with uh, Story Ventures from New York as, um, as the lead VC in the round. Uh, and I'm really excited to have Story on board as they are um, they are uh, they are the they are the perfect VC for us, given the fact that they are heavily focused on data automation and data efficiency, which is exactly the thing that we are looking at is making rehabilitation data driven. And we have also been fortunate to have all of our um, existing VCs follow on uh, in this round as well, most of them on a super pro rata level. So this goes to show the level of excitement that we have built um, in our existing v within our existing VCs and some of the new VCs that um, have joined this round as well. I think one of the key things that would that is going to happen with this round is the fact that we are very soon going to land on the American shores as well. So we are planning to launch the use um, after the FDA uh, registration by the end of this year. Um, and then beyond that, we're also looking to establish uh, our, um, our mother company in the States as well in the following year. 
So a year from now, what does this uh, look like? Sort of last question for today. Uh, uh, what will uh, Ether look like uh, a year from now? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, one of the things that we are really focusing on right now is hiring. Uh, we are currently you know, going to double our team size over the next six to nine months. Uh, and we are hiring people um, across uh, various disciplines like engineering, regulatory, manufacturing, uh, and production as well. Secondly, uh, our key focus is also on improving the device and launching the version two based on all the data that we have collected. So one of the key things that we are doing different is we have really focused on digitizing the whole end-to-end -end patient journey from a prosthetics or upper limb amputation rehabilitation standpoint. And digitizing this has given us a lot of data and we are continuously collecting data on muscle signals, uh, on device usage, as well as on the rehabilitation process as a whole. So the key thing for us in the next 12 months is to launch the next generation of product line, um, including the Zeus version two, the pattern recognition and the sensory feedback system built on all the actual data that has been collected up till now. Got it, exciting stuff. And yeah, you're one of the examples of companies that we're seeing where if you succeed, the level of data being collected around these kinds of situations will go up by orders of magnitude. Absolutely. There's never been one system capturing yeah. all that information uh, uh, before. And the availability of that data in and of itself should help drive uh, a new generation of better, stronger, more responsive, more receptive products. It's really exciting stuff. Absolutely. Well, we're delighted to be investors in the company. We're delighted we uh, were able to find one another. Uh, can't wait to see what happens uh, uh, next. Absolutely, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. It was really Thank nice you. meeting with you. Talk Thank again you. soon. Hopefully I'll get a chance to see you at some point yeah, later soon, this year. Soon. All right, thanks.